Welcome to the Alchemy of Ascension Season 3, where we are harmonizing light and shadow to embody our mystical power and purpose. I am your host, Washela Sananda, and today it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Judith Corvin Blackburn. Welcome, Judith. Thanks, Washela. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> well, I am so happy to have you. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit about Judith's bio so you have a little understanding of, of who she is and what she's done. Judith Corbin Blackburn is an award-winning author, transpersonal psychotherapist and shamanic minister who has been inspiring people to step into joy, purpose, and full inner authority for over 45 years. She passionately guides and empowers individuals to heal their wounds and reclaim their true soul nature so that collectively we can transform planet Earth into the loving, peaceful, creative place it's meant to be. Judith, Judith is the author of three books. Um, her most recent book is Activating Your 5D Frequency, a guidebook to the journey into higher dimensions. And then before that was Empowering the Spirit, a process to activate your soul potential. And way back in 1994, Judith wrote Journey to Wholeness, a guide to inner healing. So you have been on this path for a long time. You have done some groundbreaking work and I am just excited to jump in with you today. And so I'd love to just start out with a little bit of your origin story. How did you come to have this information? And you have accessed some amazing information and pulled that through in a way that you know is available to everyone now through your books, but how did this all begin for you? Well, I like to start out with, with my early beginnings, where when I was a teenager, I had a discussion with my father, and he said he was an atheist. And I went, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and we talked, and I became an atheist, <laughs> until, uh, even though I was interested in mystical things. But I think what that did is it took me out of any old paradigm of the divine. And then when I hit my mid to late 20s, um, I actually was doing yoga and reading the autobiography of a yogi. You had mentioned you could see that in my study. And um, my psyche just started opening up. Um, and all of a sudden, actually, I had a spiritual experience, full moon, very powerful, where what they the um, <clears throat> in the East would call the veils of Maya started lifting before me. But what I knew, and I was, I think I was still in graduate school, or I just gotten out of graduate school. And I knew that I didn't have the ego development to fully go through this. And I asked that it stopped. I wasn't fully ready. Um, and then I found myself weeping and I realized I was experiencing grace. Mm -hmm. And this was all just intuitive. You know, of course our, our soul carries so much from other lifetimes. So I think that just kind of uh, sort of came crashing in and crashing is an interesting word, but it, it did come crashing in. And I always refer to that as my conversionary experience because at that moment I knew the divine. So it was not an intellectual concept or something I had been fed through any kind of religious training, it was, it was inside me. And it was energy, which we understand now, I wouldn't have had the words to speak into that then. So that just, that just continued and continued. It's like, it, it, it was um, a total shift was Shayla. And you know, what I know now, I was just entering my Saturn return. I was about 28, 27, 28, and then went through some obviously profound maturing experiences, but kept going, you know, every, every decade we go through sort of more maturing experiences um, so that I was able to ground more and more the information. I, I, I understood both the nature of the psyche and the soul in the work that I do. 
And I then started attracting, as we all do, other people that were also holding uh, these visions and information. And that, that kept feeding. And uh, it's what excited me. I got very interested in astrology, which, and, um, you know, continued a yoga practice, just is far from a, a, an expert, even though I've been doing it for 50 years, but it, it, um, it's a way, you know, to stay more present, if not, and to um, just stay in touch. The, so that's basically, you know, just sort of in a nutshell, once things opened for me, they just kept opening. And um, I started teaching, oh, I can't remember how long ago, but fairly early on. And actually, um, I had found an old brochure, some friends of mine, and I had opened up a, a practice. A whole, I think we called it holistic psychotherapy. I don't know what we called it. It was a long time ago. But it was in the 70s, and I found the, the um, brochure, I don't know, a few years ago, and I looked at it, and it's what we're all doing now. So, you know, th this was the forerunner. And of course, having come of age in the 60s and early 70s, which was a time where, where consciousness really was um, exploding and, you know, new ideas and new visions and holding the idea of peace and love. I mean, those were not just um, coined sayings. We, we really felt them. So beautiful. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's amazing. I, I, I got chills when you said you were experiencing grace. And so whenever I get chills on something I'm like, oh, I want to dig in a little bit more, I would, I would love for you to just, you know, unpack a little bit of what, what was that experience like for you? Did, was it visual? Did you feel, obviously there was feeling involved, but what happened? What was that grace experience? Because I, I think that is what we all crave right everybody wants to experience that and and that you got to experience that at a young age and really like know god in that moment or whatever the divine spoke to you share a little more about that please <laughs> well it it was very much a felt experience i didn't have the word for it until well maybe i did somehow it just came in it was not visual i, I think the way i would define it now it was a huge heart opening mm. and that feeling of being interconnected with everything that is that now we know is where we're ascending now we know is that fifth dimensional frequency oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I okay that and that helps too I've had that you know I've had lots of small ones, but one in particular, a big heart opening and a heart expansion. And it was very transformational for me. And so I can really relate to that. And, and I love that you called it experiencing grace. I've never called it that, but what a beautiful representation of, you know, the heart opening up. And I do believe that's how the divine communicates with us when we're ready to surrender, I suppose, at a certain level that, that you know, that divine grace opening the heart and you do feel love and connectedness with all. Um, wow, beautiful. And thank you for sharing because I, I wish for everyone to have, you know, access. And I think we all do when, when we're ready, when it happens, you know, when you're ready and you're ready to surrender, everyone has the opportunity to have that experience because it's part of who we are. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Now, um, because of the topic of this summit, and I know this speaks um, deeply to your heart, I would love to hear you talk about um, how do you personally harmonize the light and shadow in your life? And how does that help you embody your mystical power and purpose? Well, I love that the, some of the words that you've been using are so beautiful in that title, like embody, right? We've all heard about spiritual bypass and, you know, we have the ability 
and especially certain people have these gifts, that they can go right into the higher dimensions, but they may not have a foundation in place. And I always think about that like a building. If you have a very tall building, you want to make sure you have a really, really good foundation. Um, part of that foundation is not just grounding and connecting with Mother Earth, which of course is an important part, but it is clearing our emotional field. So because I'm aware of that, you know, the emotional body in our culture has gotten so, uh, there's so much wounding and so much trauma that has been going on in, on the planet for, you know, thousands and thousands of years. And we're just getting to the point where we're going no more. We're going to clear this and we're going to, um, we're going to reverse what I call the dimensional descent, right? And this is ascension. So for me, you know, I do daily journaling. I really tune in to anytime my ego takes over, I can feel like an, a glitch in my body, so to speak, whether it's around the solar plexus or around the heart, you know, noticing when my heart's more closed than, than open and I'll write of it. I also really know, and I've seen my own development over the years, that, you know, we're so trained culturally to avoid the shadow. We think in order to be good, we have to have only loving, clear thoughts. We're not supposed to feel anger. We're not supposed to feel any of what may, we might term the lower emotions or, or uh, thought forms. Um, and yet we're human and, we're, and this is who we are. This is a part of us. If we could send love to those parts and we stop acting it out, we wouldn't have wars, we wouldn't be cruel to each other. So back to how I do it personally. So what, what I've realized is that in order to really activate self-love, which is what we need to, in order, because we're all interconnected, so to put out to the world, Pure, more and more pure love, which is what's going to heal and shift us, <clears throat> we have to be able to accept our nasty, mean thoughts. We have to be able to accept getting really pissed off and then going, wait a second, why, why am I feeling that? <laughs> oh, wait, that's, that's some old stuff. Because if I'm just feeling you know, sort of violated in some way, not respected. I can just be assertive and, and speak into that. But if there's an intensity, then that's my cue. There's old stuff and I need to be working with the feelings of it uh, or old grief or old fears. I do, one of the things I do in my psychotherapy practice is a lot of inner child work. My, my first book, which yes, was written a long, a long time ago is, is a whole process to take people through working with their inner children and their inner teenagers to reparent, essentially. So um, I will work, you know, if I see shadow stuff come up, parts that aren't accepting, parts that are judgmental, I, I will go, all right, is this my child? Is this another part of myself? And I'll work at being both loving, accepting, and neutralizing the energy. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. yeah, and that's such a big key to not be judging ourselves, not be judging. And I think that's what people naturally fall into is like, oh, no, I'm feeling anger. Or I'm having negative thoughts about that person or I'm judging and, you know, and then I must be a horrible person for doing that. And we judge ourselves <laughs> for judging others. And it's this spiral <laughs> effect. Um, and when we can just pull back and not you know, not engage that way and just notice, oh, I'm, I'm judging. What part of me is doing that? What part of me is reacting? Where is that in my makeup, my body? And what do I do about it? <laughs> well, and, and really, one of the most important things to do about it is just surround it in love. And then it kind of melts away. I had intuitively been given an image many years ago that I do a lot in my visualizations and workshops of, of finding those parts of us and shrinking them down and just patting them on the head, like, you know, a naughty child or something, you know, this is, 
So you have this feeling and we don't want to act it out and you're okay and I love you and head out or however or integrate. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah, it's great to have tools to work with those parts because yeah, they do if we don't check them and not just check them but find a way to release those, you know, then they can grow and grow and they'll keep growing until they get our attention. <laughs> and that's how we know where our work is, right? Exactly, or they get unconsciously projected outward. Mm -hmm. Where all of a sudden we're back into the we versus us and us is not good it, us is bad and we are good we i don't have to say more i don't think but we all have seen this i mean it's being acted out over and over and over again yeah the polarization and and it does feel like that's really you know it's always been there it's part of this dimension of right. little experience of reality here but you know it does feel like things have gotten really polarized and and if we have you know energy in that space it's it's creating tension for a lot of people and you know as it will um you know so maybe you can speak into how do you how do you view um like when something explodes in the world and you're you know how do you keep your heart and your attention from getting sucked into the chaos of the polarity or the polarization or my views right how do i oh, i get attached to my views and then i step back and go this isn't going to work <laughs> that I think if we get stuck in some kind of certainty mm -hmm. um, is when we are getting, literally, actually we're getting stuck in the old dimensional frequencies. <clears throat> I don't think people necessarily realize that. Um, I had actually just written a newsletter on how people are functioning off of such different narratives right now. Mm -hmm. And how I think that you know, those of us who are way showers really need to keep practicing and learning more and more to expand our container, to hold all the narratives. We may not agree with all the narratives, but, but they're part of our collective psyches or they wouldn't be here. And, and if we're gonna step into true self-love, which is not just like love of me, but love of all of us, we realize all of these different narratives are acting out different parts of this collective drama. And I think that, that again, what we come back to is not the question of, is this the right thing? Or are these people right? Or is this information right? But is this loving? Because I think that's the only way we're gonna get through this. Um, you know, what, what we've called reality in many ways is just disintegrating. Mm -hmm. Also keeping your sense of humor. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, my husband and I joke about him writing a book, um, Living on Planet Mirth, <laughs> because and we, we even did this during the uh, 2001 um, uh, attack on the towers of watching the earth show. You know, all of these things are painful. We don't want to get stuck in them. We want to allow our feelings to come up, process them through, and step back in to love. This is, this is a collective experience, and it all has lessons for us. Mm, beautiful, indeed. Um, Yes, so I'd love to now move into um, some conversation about uh, about your book, your most recent book, which um, is fascinating. And there's so much, I mean, it's, it's very packed with information. Um, something that stood out to me in your book was you, you discussed the alchemy of nine dimensions. Now, I believe that was a book by Barbara Han Clow. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, and, and I'd love to kind of unpack that conversation because it's so relevant to, you know, what this, what this uh, summit is all about. But tell me about the alchemy of nine dimensions. Can you kind of give me a understanding as let us kind of break it down for us? Okay. Well, 
Barbara was the one that really brought this into our awareness. It actually, the nine dimensional axis, it's a multi-dimensional axis and it's quite ancient. Um, she has in her book <laughs> and her husband, by the way, Jerry Klaus, she wants to make sure he gets credit for the book too. But it was really Barbara's work on the dimensions and, and she does this amazing job um, connecting it with quantum physics, by the way, I highly recommend the book to people. Um, but the non-dimensional axis, which I believe came to her through channeling Pleiadian wisdom, um, really was taught by Plato in what was called the Helioponic Mystery School, I think. And I can't find many references to it, but if we're like a better way to say it, it's sort of the scuttlebutt is that it came from Egypt. And I feel really strongly it came from Atlantis. So this is a very, very ancient system. It's not the only multidimensional system, but it's the one I love because it explains to me so much of our process. The, essentially, we as humans have access to these nine dimensions. The first dimension being in the iron crystal core of the earth and the highest dimension, the ninth, which is not the highest dimension ever, but it's the highest dimension on this axis, being in galactic center. And each of the, each of the nine dimensions have different frequencies and different gifts, but they're all, uh, th this would take way too long, uh, Washayla, but I, I do teach this and, and it is in the book. Um, each of them have the, their own gifts and they feed into each other. In, in such a beautiful way. Um, so the image that had come to me, so, you know, I, I devoured Barbara's book and I had been familiar with her actually for several decades. Um, but, and I, and I started teaching, after I read Alchemy, I started teaching multidimensionality, but what I wasn't as clear as, as I am now is the understanding of our going one from, being 3D actually slash 4D humans into becoming 5D slash 6D humans. And that's what we're talking about with Ascension. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and I guess the alchemy is the magic that happens as we can step into owning these frequencies within ourselves. Now, you know, that nine dimensional frequency, that's kind of Nirvana. This is something that very few of us, certainly not me, can walk around feeling that frequency all the time. Although I think we're evolving more toward that. But the, the step is, and, and this is where it gets a little complex for our interview, the fourth dimension is set up in such a way that in order to fully access the higher five dimensions, we've got to clear our emotional field. And they speak a lot about that in the book, how to navigate through there. So that portals actually open in a, a much more, I, I will say pure way, maybe in a much more intense or larger way mm -hmm. um, so that we can access all this incredible wisdom and, and love and, um, understanding of who we really are. Yeah. Okay, we are so much larger than we've all been programmed. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to speak into that for a minute because, um, you know, what I've found for myself is when I am able to allow myself to surrender into those things that are that are upsetting to me or, you know, like allow myself to sort of dissolve my boundaries uh, that are around my, my, my psyche and my heart, my emotional body, like you're saying, and open up to just the love or the connectedness um, and let that go, like the willingness to just let go and sort of sink into the knowing that this is all me at the highest level it's we're all the same one having all these different experiences 
So if I can just relax and, and not be polarized, um, that's when I get to touch into these experiences of, I think what you probably <clears throat> are referring to as the five, fifth 5D, 60 human um, consciousness and knowing like, okay, that part of me over there that's warring between two countries <laughs> is just a part that's not experiencing this, this connection, this love, and it's fighting against itself. And, you know, when we can put ourselves in the mindset of we are all of it, everything that annoys us, everything we can't stand, everything that makes us angry, and everything we love and appreciate and are grateful for. And how can we just allow it to be without having to, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to go over there personally and fix that, you know, but I can open up to understanding that I'm a multidimensional being and I contain it all at the highest level. And we, I don't mean I, Washela, I mean, I, as the, the, the consciousness, it's much bigger than the individual. So is this what you mean, um, what, what you would say is, you know, allowing ourselves to be the bridge from the third dimensional uh, human experience to the fifth or higher dimensional human experience? Yes, absolutely. You know, the, the characteristics of 5D are unconditional love, and I always include of self and others, um, uh, unity consciousness, understanding everything is connected in consciousness. And then what I like to call unbridled creativity. So when you're talking about the warring countries, whether it's a part of ourselves that's warring with each other or on a much larger scale, imagine just putting it in the heart and allowing that alchemy to occur. Mm. And you know what you said earlier about the judgment piece, whenever we're in judgment and attached to the judgment, um, it, that limits our ability to be able to go into that state of acceptance and relaxation, which is where the alchemy can really occur. Mm -hmm. But when I can, you know, um, I heard Elizabeth Kubler-Ross speak at a, a conference, gosh, I'm trying to think, I guess it was early 80s. <clears throat> and um, I, I think most of the viewers will know she's the person that that made huge inroads into death and dying and understanding the process of grieving and you know she's an amazing woman um, but she did a talk at this conference I think she was the keynote and um, talked about finding the Hitler in all of us mm -hmm. you know, and she had been in a concentration camp she actually had tattoos on her wrist so what she was saying, and again, this was so many decades ago, but she knew we all have this capacity. It doesn't make us bad, but if we refuse to accept the parts of ourselves that are angry or violent or want to do harm, then they actually could do harm. If we can accept them as part of the human condition, we have been in suffering mode for thousands of years. And out of suffering and wounding and trauma, these feelings arise. These shadow thoughts arise. And if we can say, okay, hmm, that wasn't a very nice thought I had. You know, and I observe it in myself, like I'll get this thought, I'll go, ooh, <laughs> I'd like to just make it go away and pretend I didn't feel it or think it, but I know better. Mm -hmm. I know that if I do that, it doesn't go away. It goes underground and that's where it can do harm. So if I can see it and go, hmm, not thrilled that's around, but it is part of me and it's part of the human psyche. And I'm going to do my best to send a compassion and let it go into my heart. Be clear that it's not to do harm or it's not to act out in any way. Mm -hmm. um, then, you know, not only, of course, do I make myself more whole so that I can embody my mystical powers more and my purpose more, but I, I help the whole hologram, you know, this collective matrix by being able to say, okay, yes, these things are here. Let's surround them with love. Let's let them dissolve into something else that doesn't do harm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you commented on allowing the alchemy. Um, and that's something that I think that in itself is such a powerful concept because we want to fix it. We want to fix things. We want to, we want to put, you know, make it better and repair it. And, and, you know, we want to, <laughs> we just want to fix things. And sometimes we can't. And that idea that when we go within and to take anything that's bothering us, anything at all, and go within and become the cocoon where, you know, the, the caterpillar is alchemizing, transforming alchemically to something different. The only way we can really do that is by going within, by touching those places, being with them. We're not fixing it then, we're being with it and allowing that transformation to happen. And I think for a lot of people, that's a big piece because um, we think culturally that we have to go do something. And when we can't do something about what's wrong, we feel helpless, we feel limited, we feel out of, out of effect, we feel victimized, we feel all these things. And so that's, you know, the alchemy of going within and embracing all of it, all that we are, allows that process. And that's when you said allowing the alchemy, that's a key, a huge key to personal ascension and transformation. Absolutely. And of course, ironically, it's one of the hardest. Yes. <laughs> because we're so programmed. Um, to, and our egos, I mean, the ego doesn't disappear. The ego, we just need to keep observing it. I, I, I use the imagery of we invite the ego for tea and we sit at the head of the table. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and the ego serves functions, but the ego carries so many false beliefs that like one of which is that we can fix it <laughs> by doing something external, when in fact we fix it by fixing it within ourselves. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a lifelong practice and being gentle with ourselves and understanding this is hard, this is hard in its very simplicity. Yeah. Yes. And now I want to, I love that you said that it's a perfect segue into conscious life creation and the envisioning and the holding the vision of the life that we desire of that fifth dimensional experience of humanity, because while it might not be what we're seeing evidenced in the world, that the world starts within and we project it out. So please speak to us about your, your vision of visioning and creating our lives consciously. Well, I guess I'm going to have to talk about the sixth dimension. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Which actually was Plato's world of forms. And I, I didn't realize this. When I took philosophy in 1964 at college, I'm like, I had a terrible professor, it was boring. I had no idea what he was talking about. Decades later, all of a sudden I got it. Even though I, I, at the time I didn't, I couldn't put the sixth dimension or quantum field, field of plenty onto it. But it literally is, and, and again, you know, I can't go into the full nine dimensions. Barbara does a great job. I think I have taken it in a way that, that makes it accessible to people so that they can understand that. Um, perhaps more easily. Um, but in the six dimensional consciousness, which again, as we ascend, I think we're going to be primarily not just fifth dimensional beings, but also we're going to hold this, which, it, which is a more physical dimension, but we're going to hold this um, awareness of this other dimension that holds what I call the idealized energetic blueprint mm -hmm. of one who we are, but also of everything that exists. So in this sixth dimension, any, any thought, any quality, any belief that we have goes there. And it's an interactive process. So an example I like to give, if collectively we believe that peace is uh, impossible, 
that humans will always be fighting each other. That concept exists in the sixth dimension in an energetic form. If we evolve as we are to wait a minute, of course we can have peace. We can have peace within, we can have peace without. The more and more people that collectively can accept that, again, that's in the sixth dimension. And the more people that, that kind of feed that belief, the stronger it gets. So everything we, every thought and quality exists in energetic form in 6D. But how it's fed depends on what will manifest in our 3D reality. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways to create, of course, well, let's see, again, this is a long process, but one, we want to find out the part of us that doesn't believe, okay? So yes, I want this loving, peaceful world. Well, is there a part of me that's going, oh, no, that's impossible. Well, I want to bring that part. That's my shadow. I want to bring that part into my awareness, pat it on its head, send it love, allow it to transform. But then I also want to feed these images of what does a loving, peaceful world look like. And this is toward the end of my book. I, I talk a lot about envisioning our 5D planet because I feel so strongly that <clears throat> we've got to step away from all this, these dystopian images. Mm -hmm. That that with these images, people begin, you know, it feeds into a belief system. So sure, we could create dystopia if we want, but why not <laughs> create a beautiful world instead with filled with healthy, thriving people and children and animals? <laughs> and, um, and the more of us that can hold those visions in whatever form come to us, the more, the closer we become for them to show up on 3D Earth. Yeah. Uh, yes. You're speaking my my language here, <laughs> um, because one of my you know my missions and my visions and why I do these summits is to create pathways to that vision for people. Um, I know you know there are a lot of people talking about this, a lot of people working in these realms. However, it's not the normal conversation on the street. The normal conversation, you know, is the news and the a lot of the negative, mm -hmm. the chaos. And that's what's being broadcast into people's homes through their radios and televisions and computers. So there, there must be pathways for the positivity, for the what we're creating. And that's to me what my vision or my mission is about creating and holding space for that higher vibrational human experience on planet earth. And I believe that the dimensions are layered. So while some people can be right here next to us, fighting and warring and being victimized and all of that um, side by side in the same sort of space, but maybe not the same frequency, we can also be over here having a loving um, wholeness, blissful, graceful experience and working through the stuff that's going on over here. And, um, and we must have um, positive influences and that's why we broadcast these things, you know, positive influences and pathways and conversations and people to share these visions so that we can more easily as community step into this higher frequency reality. And it's not about going somewhere to get there. It's about changing state from within. Can you speak into that? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, exactly what you said. Um, well, Shayla, it's... Um, all the chaos we see externally is part of our psyche. If we no longer fear it and no longer give it power, no longer feed it, again, that's, we you can put it in our hearts and allow the alchemy. It's, uh, we, we have a very rich tapestry of experience <laughs> for the last 10,000 years, at least on this planet. Um, I think that there, 
some primary resistances that, that we all have to look at within ourselves that show up collectively. Um, one is that we have been programmed to believe it's always gonna be this way and that it always was this way and that's not true. First of all, I believe there were many fifth dimensional societies on this planet. There was Atlantis in its heyday, you know, that went through a lot of different shifts. Lemuria, which I, I feel connected to intuitively, but I don't have as much cognitive information. Um, very ancient Egypt. This is what I saw when I was in Egypt is, whoa, the very ancient pre-pharaohs were operating at a different frequency. There was a dimensional descent. And I came to realize, oh, that's what the biblical fall is trying to say that there's actually been this collective descent. And now we're trying to reverse it. But until we own, I guess would be the way I'd like to say it, that we've all been programmed to believe that in this descent, um, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. And you can't change it. And even those of us who are envisioning and in doing our best to inspire and, and holding people in as much as we can and as much as we can generate in those other frequencies, we've got to clear those beliefs in ourselves. Um, I, I love to, and I can't remember exactly how you phrase this, but people need to remember they're not alone in this. There's huge numbers of us that are awakening and that are um, having heart openings and that are stepping back and going, oh, maybe the real wisdom is inside of me, not from the internet <laughs> or the news or the whatever. Um, so part of in, in clearing that shadow is to really allow those limited beliefs, those resistances like, well, wait a minute, I don't think this can happen up into our awareness and to work with those. <clears throat> the other piece is, well, maybe it'd be all boring. I had a young woman at one of my my workshops and she articulated it but but i've been well aware of this um you know was will this make us non-creative everybody's all lovey and <laughs> getting along and sharing and oh wow and where, where's the drama but in fact it's not boring it's hugely creative because there's always a sense of evolution going on you know one of the images i talk about in my book is you know, instead of having these dramas, uh, painful dramas, we put our creativity to, oh, how can we grow food in a really tiny space that's going to feed the world? Or how can we harness energies that are part of nature, not way beyond solar, but, you know, part of the energy field in new ways? How can we allow children to learn and explore and connect with their soul purpose in, in ways we've never realized before. And, and it goes on and on. I mean, this is developmental, but uh, it's not boring. <laughs> That's the piece yeah. I really want to say. And I think there is a piece of, of the human consciousness that, that thinks, well, maybe it would be. Yeah, you know, I was getting an interesting visual as you were speaking and I feel like it's meant to be shared. So I'm just going to say it. Um, and I just came out of a, a week long course where I was looking at a lot of brain waves, neuroscience. <laughs> and, and so I was seeing a brain wave and how it goes up and down and in gamma, you know, they, they go like, high beta and gamma, the brain waves are really big, you know, when you look at them on a printed out, but I was seeing this brain wave going up and down and how it compares to the human experience over what we perceive as a long time and it was what I saw was we we start at this low uh maybe lower frequency less evolved state and then as time goes on we evolve and evolve and evolve and that you know that brain waves going up until um we get to a point where we're of a frequency that we can evolve out of this dimensional experience into a, a new level that's not perceived by those of us in this frequency right <laughs> and then um and then 
when that happens and enough go, it starts over, you know? And, and so maybe that's the cycles that, that have happened because as we look to, to way, way, way back into prehistory, um, we can see there have been uh, uh, cycles of evolution and descent and evolution and descent. And I know that's part of the indigenous teachings as well. <laughs> that's interesting when it gets connected with brainwaves. And, and I think that's one of the things that's so exciting is that science is getting to the point where it can really support and um, inform us in ways that our left brain needs, <laughs> for lack of a better way to say it. <laughs> yeah, so we can conceptualize it. Yes. So one of the like conversations, I don't know how much time we have for this, but I'd love to just brush into it a little bit. I, I heard you mention um, 12, we actually have 12 senses uh, as humans. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear just so you unpack that concept a little bit, because most people are not familiar with more than, you know, than our, the human senses that were, were given. But I've heard a lot of conversation about the higher senses. Of course, intuition falls into that. Would you talk into uh, the 12 senses? Yes. And, and I can't give you a lot of specifics because I learned about it um, through an African shaman named Credo Mutwa, who recently passed. Um, and that was from Linda Tucker's book on the white lions. Um, but he talked about, he was half, um, oh, the tribes will come to me. Well, I'm not gonna spend time, it'll pop back in. Um, Bushman and Zulu. And I think he was talking about the Bushman. They go back 100,000 100, years. And they are using all 12 senses. And, and he describes they can hear the spheres turning mm -hmm. in the cosmos. They can see the craters on the moon. So even what we consider our physical senses are so finely, we have the ability to finely attune them. And um, it, it, several things, you know, on one hand, one of the things that's happening more and more as we're stepping into this fifth dimensional frequency is we're becoming more and more intuitive and empathic. We're, we're connecting and we're feeling. And there are, I think uh, Jane Roberts in the Seth work of many years ago also talked about these inner senses. And I don't remember the details, but I think the piece that's so important is to understand how much of a work in progress we are. And there's so much more about our own evolution that we're in that we don't know yet. It was very much what you were saying, you know, the brainwave frequencies shift and we don't know what things will look like, sound like, feel like, hear like once we get to a certain level. Um, the other piece I wanted to say though with these 12 senses and I don't, I can't, you know, tell you for sure this is accurate, but it's coming to me. So I feel I should speak into it. These 12 strands of DNA that we have, two of which have been active and the other 10 that conventional scientists were calling junk, which I gotta tell you, it just makes me laugh. How can you have 10 strands of DNA that are junk and useless? Makes no, no the sense. human <laughs> form is um, efficient. You wouldn't right. have junk. <laughs> exactly. It's like, of course we're not, it's not junk, <laughs> but, but it has been deactivated. We have allowed it to deactivate. And part of the ascension process is reactivating. And, and within those genes are codes that open up this wisdom, open up these frequencies for us. And, um, and because we have 12, it may well be connected with some of these inner senses. I suspect it's going to be a slow, well, time is relative, but <laughs> in 3D time, it's going to seem like like a slow process that those of us who, and, and, but it also happens without our fixing it. It happens through the heart. As the heart opens, as we can breathe a sense of light and uh, uh, accept more and more light into our bodies that actually begins to ask different parts of our genes to express. So th 
it's not that we change the genes from what I understand, it's that what gets expressed changes. Mm -hmm. And as we do trauma and wounding work, healing those over and over if necessary, it deactivates the, part, the trauma part of the genes, which have kept us in a limited functioning. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That makes sense to me. I think with the, you know, considering how our senses beyond the physical senses can work, um, there's this concept of perception, you know, and perceiving beyond physicality, mm -hmm. perceiving beyond the seen, the known, and, and then there's the trust or the allowing the whatever, the divine, the universe, the, the space around us to interact with us and just opening up our concept of how that can appear in our lives. Yes, uh, it, it was phrased very beautifully in a book whose name I just forgot, and it's called Expanding Our ba Bandwidth, mm -hmm. where, you know, we have been programmed with a very narrow bandwidth, but in fact, we have the capacity for a very wide bandwidth, and that's exactly what you're talking about. Then the universe informs us. Yes. And then by clearing that shadow... <clears throat> Because people, of course, struggle between, okay, what is wisdom and intuition and what is imagination in the sense of making stuff up that's not accurate? The only way to tell us how it feels and the only way we can really get tuned into that feeling part of us is clearing and working through the shadow stuff so it doesn't pop in. And again, it's a process. We're not perfect. It's going to pop in. But the more we can tune in, the more we can embody, right, those higher frequencies know what they feel like. I always start my classes or workshops off helping people feel into this. And it takes two minutes, <laughs> which I also find interesting, right? We think, oh, it's got to be such hard work. Well, the, the work is learning how to keep coming back to it, but getting there is not hard. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It really is just in so much about intention. And also I wanted to speak into your, um, you said, is this imagination? Am I imagining this? Well, we're imagining all of it all the time. Um, I'm actually in, I'm taking a course this year that's called the School of Imagination. Uh, I've always been in a, a, you know, a visionary and imaginer, and I, I'd like to hone that skill. <laughs> you well, know? Yeah, actually, that was a poor, I used a poor choice of words by going imagining, imagining, because imagination is wonderful, and it does connect us to the larger picture. Um, even though that's what kids have been put down for, <laughs> you know, you're just imagining this. So I think it's a collective word that people understand, but I think a better way to say it is this just a projection mm. of an old belief system yeah, or a projection that somebody else gave me to say it's truth versus, um, am I getting something? I guess one could ask really, am I getting something that will serve? Mm. Am I getting something that that will, you know, really help the energy become more loving on the planet? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and is this loving to me? Yes, because um, that's where it starts, right? Yeah. You know, back to that self-love piece, what I've realized over the years in myself, the way I realize I've been able to step into more self-love is that if I screw up, if I, you know, act in a way that's not my best self, I can accept it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, that wasn't my best self. Let me see if I can do better, but you know, I'm human. And, and I think the more we do that again, it, it creates an energy yeah. that, that feeds us, that, that embraces us. And then everyone we come in contact with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's also dissolving the illusion of perfection. Yes. Uh, perfection is a made up thing that 
it's you, we are works in progress. Nobody's done. <laughs> and, and I like embrace that idea of being a work in progress. I mean, then again, I, I think that's too what allows more joy in our lives. Yeah. Right. Of course, we're not perfect. <laughs> and, and when we can put that expectation aside or alchemize it in some way, then, then our life immediately becomes more joyful. Yeah. And when we focus on joy, we get more joy. Yes. It's funny how that works, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. I've loved every minute of this conversation. We are coming to the end of our hour, but so let's start with your free gift. Would you share about that? Sure. It's just it's very simple. It's a meditation they can download on soul contracts. If they get on my website, empoweringthespirit.com and, and sign up for my newsletter, they will automatically get an email that has the down, that has the the link to download the meditation and they can keep walking with it should they choose. Wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. And those meditations are very helpful for focusing on, you know, focusing the mind. So thank you for that. That's very generous. And I just appreciate you showing up and all this amazing information that you brought to us today, Judith. Thank you so much. Oh, and thank you so much. I have so enjoyed myself too, Ashella. That's when we know it's working, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, so it feels good. It feels right. And thank you for shining your light over and over again and doing the, the work and the that you're holding for all of us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And to everyone watching, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you all so much. I love you. Have a wonderful day or night wherever you are and namaste.